Hello everyone. So far we've covered the basics of Viper. So in this video I want to put together all of the things that we have covered so far and create a simple Viper contract. So in this video we'll create a payment channel. Before I explain what a payment channel is, I'm going to first explain a situation where there is no payment channel and then explain the problem that a payment channel solves. Alright, to begin with, let's imagine that Alice wants to send Ether to Bob. So she sends her Ether, and she wants to do this multiple times. Perhaps, let's say she wants to send it five times. But every time she sends her Ether to Bob, she'll have to pay a transaction fee that goes to the miner. So if she sends Ether to Bob three times, then the miner will collect the transaction fee three times. To give you an example of when Alice needs to pay Bob multiple times, let's imagine that Alice visits a restaurant and she orders a hamburger from Chef Bob. In the process, she pays her one ether and some of the transaction fee goes to the miner. Now, after eating her hamburger, the food at this restaurant is so good that Alice decides to order a taco. So what does she do? She first sends the ether to Chef Bob. Some of that transaction fee goes to the miner, and Alice receives her taco. After eating her taco, now she wants a dessert. So Alice orders a dessert by sending her ether, the transaction fee goes to the miner, and she gets her dessert. So in total, that's three transactions. But something is wrong here. Let's think for a second. If we go to a restaurant and order some food, and then later on decide to order another food and then finish off with some desserts. Would we swipe our credit card every time we make an additional order? No, we don't do that. What would we do instead? So in an ideal situation, Alice would order her hamburger and then order her taco and then order her dessert. After she is done with the meal, she would pay for all of the meal by sending three ethers. And the miner only gets a single transaction fee. So here, instead of Alice sending one transaction for each order, she makes several orders, and once she is done with her meal, she sends a single transaction. So how would we achieve this using a smart contract? A payment channel is a smart contract where Alice will be able to send ether to Chef Bob multiple times, and this will be done off-chain. And Bob can finalize the payment by sending a single transaction to the smart contract and claiming all of the ether that Alice has agreed to pay so far. So how does this work? So first, Alice deploys a smart contract, sending all of the ether that she wants to lock into this contract. In this example, Alice is locking up three ethers. Next, Alice orders her hamburger and also promising Bob that she'll pay one ether for this hamburger. And she does this by signing a message that says Bob can spend one ether from the smart contract. So Alice sends the signature to Bob, and Bob sends the hamburger to Alice. This is done off-chain. So there is no on-chain transaction involved here. This is just the exchange of signature and a hamburger. Next, Alice wants to order a taco. So she signs a message saying that Bob can spend two ether from the smart contract, sends the signature over to Bob, and Alice gets the taco. And likewise for the dessert. Alice gets the dessert, and Bob gets the signature that says Bob can spend three ethers from the smart contract. All of this is done off-chain, so there is no transaction fees involved so far. Now to finalize the payment and claim the three ethers locked in the smart contract, Bob will submit a message signed by Alice saying that he can spend three ethers from the smart contract. The smart contract checks that it was indeed signed by Alice and unlocks the three ethers sending it to Bob. In this whole process, there was only one transaction, so there's only one transaction fee to pay to the miner. And that is a basic example of how a payment channel works. Alright, so let's implement this using Viper. I'm going to store the address of the sender in a state variable called sender. And it's going to be a public address. We're also going to need a receiver, so I'll call this 
receiver. So Alice will be the sender and Bob will be the receiver. When the smart contract is deployed, we'll need to set the sender to Alice and the receiver to Bob. So we'll do that inside the init function. So I'll say external. And this contract needs to be able to accept Ether when this contract is created. This will be the Ether that will be locked in this contract until the payment is finalized. And we do that by saying payable. To the init function, we'll pass in the address of Bob as receiver, and it will be a type address. We'll put a basic check making sure that the receiver address is not a zero address. So we'll say assert receiver is not equal to zero address. This zero address is a built-in constant inside Viper. And if the receiver is indeed a zero address, we'll say that the error message is receiver is equal to zero address. Once we know that the receiver is not a zero address, we'll go ahead and assign the state variables. So we'll say self.sender is equal to message.sender. So Alice is going to deploy this contract. So here, Alice will be message.sender. The receiver will be Bob, and this address of the receiver will be provided by Alice when she deploys the contract. So when Alice deploys this contract, she's going to send some ether. So that is why we, we declare the here as payable. And then we set the sender to the address of Alice and the receiver to the address of Bob. Next, let's write the function that will output the message that we're going to be signing. Now, we probably want a, both an internal and an external function. So I'll start off by writing the internal function. So I'll say internal. And then I'll say this function will be peer. We're going to declare this function as peer because this function will not need to read anything from the blockchain. We'll name this function get hash with an underscore. The message that Alice is going to be signing is the amount of ether that she's going to pay Bob. So it will be amount uint256. We'll hash this message so the output will be bytes32. And we'll return the hash of the amount by saying return get check 256 convert the amount to bytes 32. However, there's one problem with this approach. The problem is called signature replay attack. To briefly give you an example of a signature replay attack, imagine that Alice creates a payment channel with Bob and Alice signs a message saying that Bob can claim one ether from this payment channel. Alice also creates a payment channel with Carol. But in this payment channel, Alice does not sign any signatures. If we are just signing the amount of ether that the receiver can claim, then what Bob can do here is claim the one ether from his payment channel and then get the signature over to Carol. Now Carol could use the same signature and also claim one ether even though Alice did not sign any signature with Carol. So that is signature replay attack. And to prevent this from happening, we'll need to include the address of this contract in the message that we're signing. And by doing so, we're saying that this signature is only valid for this channel. And even if Bob hands over the signature to Carol, in the payment channel between Alice and Carol, that signature will be invalid. So let's include the address of this contract inside the message that we're signing. So we'll need to concat two data, the amount and the address of this contract. So we'll do that by saying concat. And then we'll say convert self to bytes 32. And now we have a message that is protected from signature replay attack. We'll also make an external version of this function so that we can get the hash and then sign it. So I'll copy the function signature 
paste it below and call it external and to differentiate between the internal and external function I'll remove the underscore the function signature will be the same and now this function will be declared as view function since it's going to be calling this internal function and we do that by saying return self dot underscore get hash passing in the input recall from a previous video about verifying signature that this hash is not the actual hash that is being signed instead we need to prefix it with the message ethereum sign message and then take the hash and that is the actual hash that is signed. So let's create a function to compute the actual hash that was signed. Again, it's going to be internal. And this will be a view function since this function will be calling this get hash function. I'll name it underscore get if signed hash. The input will be the amount of ether that the receiver can claim. And this function will return a bytes32 hash. First, we'll compute the hash by saying hash is equal to bytes32. And then say self dot get hash, passing in the input amount. And then we'll return the get check 256 with the prefix ethereum sign message followed by the actual hash we'll also create an external version of this function so i'm gonna paste it here change internal to external remove the underscore and inside the function body we'll just say return self dot underscore get sign if hash and passing in the input. We also need a function to verify the signature. So I'll create an internal function. And again, it will be a view function and I'll name it verify. For the input, we'll pass in the amount of ether that can be claimed by the receiver. Followed by the signature, which is a bytes of length 65. For the output, it will return a boolean, and this will tell if the signature is a valid signature or not. The first thing that we'll do is get the eve signed hash. So we'll call the internal function self dot get eve signed hash, passing in the input. And then we'll split the signature into three parts, the R, S, and the B value. And finally, we'll check the signature by saying return EC recover, passing in the Eve signed hash, and the parameters B, R, S. This function will return the address of the signer, so we'll compare it with the signer that we expect it to be which is self.sender. So if this signature was indeed signed by the sender, then this function will return true, otherwise it will return false. Again, we'll create an external version of this function. So I'll replace this with external, remove the underscore, and then say return self.verify amount C. When Bob wants to finalize the payments, he'll have to submit a signature to this contract. And this contract will send Ether back to him. And the remaining Ether back to Alice. So this will be a external function and we'll call this close. For the input, it takes in the amount of Ether that Bob can claim. And Bob will have to provide a signature given from Alice. We only want Bob to be able to call this function, so I'll say assert message.sender is equal to self dot 
receiver. And if it's not, we'll say the error message is not receiver. Next, we'll check the signature by saying assert self dot verify. We'll check that the amount and the signatures are valid. And if it's not, we'll say invalid signature. So once we have a valid signature and message.sender is equal to the receiver, we'll send this amount of ether to the receiver by saying raw call to self.receiver. The data that we're sending is zero bytes. And the amount of ether that we're sending to the receiver is the amount. Once this amount of ether is sent to the receiver, we'll delete this contract by saying self destruct. Self destruct takes in a single input address to send the leftover ether stored in this contract. So here we'll say self dot sender. So this final code will send amount of ether to the receiver and self-destruct will send the remaining ether stored in this contract to sender. And this will also delete this smart contract from the blockchain. Now there's a possibility that the receiver does a re-entrancy into this function and take more ether than what the sender has agreed to pay. For example, let's say that there is two ethers in this contract and Alice signs to pay Bob one ether. Bob calls this function, does a re-entrancy, and he takes away two ethers instead of one. So we'll protect this contract by saying non-re-entrant and we'll name this block just block. All right, we're almost done. But let's now imagine a situation where Alice and Bob do not agree. For example, Alice only signed a message to pay Bob one ether, but Bob says that Alice should pay him two ethers. And as long as Bob doesn't call this function, Alice's two ether is stuck in this contract. So we need a way to expire this payment channel so that the sender can receive all of the funds locked in this contract. What I mean here is that if the receiver does not call this function in a certain amount of time, then the sender will be able to call another function to claim all of the ether that is stored in this contract. So we need to first set an expiration to this payment channel. So we'll create a state variable called expires at, and it will be a public uint256. We'll set the duration of this payment channel to seven days by saying constant uint256 and it will be equal to 7 times 24 times 60 times 60. So 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours times 7 days. And when this contract is created, we'll set the expire at Uh, to the current timestamp plus the duration. So this payment channel can expire seven days after this contract is created. Lastly, we need a function that the sender can call to force close this payment channel and withdraw all of the funds locked in this contract. So I'm going to scroll down and it will be an external function. I'll name this function cancel. This function can only be called by the sender and it can only be called if the current timestamp is greater than or equal to the expires at state variable. And if it's not, we'll say not expired. If the current timestamp is after the expiration date, then we'll go ahead and delete this contract by saying self 
destruct and sending all of the ether in this contract to the sender. I copied the code onto Remix and then compiled it. But due to a bug in Remix, I cannot deploy a Viper contract. So I'll just explain how Alice and Bob will interact with this contract. Let's say that Alice deploys this contract sending three ether. So the sender will be Alice, the receiver will be Bob, and this contract can be deleted by Alice seven days after this contract was deployed. Let's say that Alice agrees to pay Bob one ether. She will call this function get hash, which will return the hash, and then using MetaMask, she will sign this hash. Later on, Alice agrees to Bob that she will pay two ethers. So what does she do? She calls this function again, passing in two ether for the input, and then signing the output hash and giving it to Bob. Bob can now call this close function to finalize the payment. Bob currently has two signatures from Alice. The first signature to claim one ether and the second signature to claim two ethers. From Bob's perspective, it makes more sense to claim two ethers than one ether. So although he has two signatures, he will most likely pass in a signature to claim the two ethers. So he will call this function, get his two ethers, and the remaining amount of ether, which is one ether, is sent back to Alice. So this is a situation where Bob is happy to claim two ethers. But let's rewind the clock a little bit and let's say that Bob wants Alice to pay him three ethers. But so far, Alice only agrees to pay two ethers. And as long as Bob does not call this function, Alice's ether is locked in this contract. So even though Alice wants her one ether back, she cannot get it because Bob does not want to call this function. So we're in a stalemate. And let's say that seven days has passed. So now Alice can call this function cancel and she can claim all three ethers locked in this contract, even though she signed a message saying that Bob can claim two ethers. So for Bob, even though he wants to claim three ethers, by the time the expiration comes, all three ethers will be sent back to Alice and he will get zero. So it makes sense for him to call this close function and claim the two ether rather than losing all three ethers. Okay, so that was an example of a payment channel. I think this is a good example that puts together the basic concepts in Viper. And it also illustrates how to design a smart contract so that both parties are incentivized to cooperate. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.